One way we all get better at understanding, writing and playing music is by analysing it. This basically consists of telling ourselves a story in words which aims to explain the story of sound that we hear. Ours is not a fictional story though, like the music might be, or at least we hope it not to be. It will be based on what we have come to understand about how music works. Musical analysis is a self-correcting exercise. The more we do it, the more we will get feedback about whether our theories hold up. The feedback is music itself, which will allow us to test the consistency of our ideas over time, much like when you're learning a language and listen to native speakers to test what you understand about that language. So let's analyse our famous melody of Happy Birthday, whose meaning and story we are already familiar with. Someone just got a year older and we're making a day of it. So in C major, the first phrase of Happy Birthday is G G A G C B. A musical phrase is a part of the melody we can intuitively isolate, like this little bit that literally goes with a phrase, a sentence, the lyrics, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. There's many perspectives we can look at melody from to begin analysing it, but the first thing we might want to do is to get a tonal overview. That's to say, identify the key and scale degrees being used. So what key were we in if G is the dominant of the key? C. C. C major here. So that's the key. Now when we look to the scale degrees being used in a melody, we can think both in terms of the number of the scale degree, which shows us the position in the scale and the type of interval, third, sixth, fifth, etc. the note makes with the first tonic. And we can of course think in terms of the scale degree name, which often alludes to relationships and ideas that the degree number doesn't. So in terms of the numbers of the scale degrees, what degrees do we have in this phrase? If it is G, G, A, G, C, B in C major. So we start with five, the fifth degree. And how does it continue if our notes are G, G, A, G, C, B? So G, G, A, G in numbers? Uh, five, six, five. But it's G, G. Five, five, six. Five. C, B. And you want me to go forward or back? Does that sound? Five, five six, five, eight, seven. Brilliant. Great. Five, five, six, five, eight, seven. So for the C, it makes more sense to say eight than one because we are rising to that note. G, G, A, G, C, B. So its position or function there is much more like the eighth than the first degree, no, as we're rising to that C. So we can represent the melodic phrase in this way with numbers and at a glance, this is a great way to get an overview of a phrase. Five, five, six, five, eight, seven. Okay. The more you do that, the more meaningful those numbers will become to you. But those numbers speak only to the relationship with the first degree of the scale. The five is a perfect fifth from the tonic, six, a sixth, a major sixth, no, in the case of major scales, and so on. But as mentioned, the scale degree names signal to relationships that the degree numbers by themselves do not. So in terms of scale degree names, we of course begin the melody with the dominant degree of the scale. What does the word dominant remind us of? Of what ideas or relationships? Domain, strength. Domain, good, and strength which dominating, mm. good. So dominant can remind us of domain and dominate, and these words can relate to many nuanced ideas regarding the sound of the fifth scale degree in different contexts. The dominant, being the furthest thing from the tonic, dominates with its high tension or musical instability, requiring a return to the tonic to feel resolved. But the dominant is not only the opposite thing to the tonic, but also the most similar, they are similars and opposites. The tonic is our starting point, home, the first degree, and also our destination, the eighth degree. But the dominant is also a domain of its own. The dominant is the halfway point between home and destination, equidistant from both, which might also make it the place we are most likely to stay and set up anew in. And in fact, as we've seen previously, the most common change in key in a piece of music is to the dominant. A piece in C major, if it is to change key, is most likely to move to G major. Why was this? 
What difference is there between the notes of the C and G major keys? In C major, we have all straight notes. In G major, we have... Sharps. One sharp. One sharp. So there's just a sharp in it between these two keys. What sharp is that? F sharp. F sharp. Always the first sharp. So they have all the same notes in a different order, apart from F in C major, which is F sharp in G major. So the tonic and the dominant are indeed opposites, but they are also similars. Their keys consist of most of the same notes. So if we dominate too long, we start to move away from dominating and into domesticating. The dominant begins to feel like home, like the tonic, like the tone the other tones are relating back to. The contrast between these two things, the doubt of whether we are dominating with tension or domesticating it into a new key, adds a whole new layer of tension in itself. Such ideas and considerations flow from or are inspired by the scale degree names more than by their numbers, which is easy to appreciate from dominant, dominate, domain, domesticate. So this melody begins with a dominant note and after this dominant note, what happens? You repeat it. Yeah, we get another dominant. So maybe Happy Birthday is channeling this dominant doubt of are we in the key of G or C? Although it might be early on in the song for it to be doing that, we'll have to see how this interacts with the wider musical context. What is the time signature of Happy Birthday? This is much easier to work out than we might initially think. All we need to do is sing or hum the song and let our hand naturally mark a time and then analyze what our hand is doing. So we want to do this without thinking and then think about what our hand is doing. So we sing or hum and mark our hand. Hab. No, that's the rhythm. So you've just reproduced the rhythm then, no? We want to find the time signature, the beat, the equal divisions of time. So we're not going to clap the rhythm, we're going to sing it and we're going to mark with our hand without thinking too much about what our hand does. So let's do it together. Happy birthday to you. Now, to count how many beats per measure we have in Happy Birthday, we first need to identify the strong beats, or rather, every how many beats does your hand move more, or do you feel an impulse? Your hand is already doing it. So what is the top number of the time signature? How many beats per measure do we have? I think four. One, two, three, four. Don't worry about counting the beats for now. Just try to look for, for how often we have a strong beat. So every how many beats does your hand move more or do you feel an impulse? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Ah, aha. Uh -huh. So what is the top number of the time signature? How many beats per measure do we have? Three. Three. Your hand is marking a strong beat every three beats. So it's three beats per measure. Now, unless the song is particularly fast or slow, the most common note we'll use to represent each beat is, you know I can guess this. The most common note? Yeah, to represent each beat. What, what might that be? You know it or can guess it. A C. A t note in terms of time. No, we're talking about, oh, right. we're talking about time. Like You've gone notes. to another dimension. Yeah. <laughs> we are in the realm of, of time. A quarter note? A quarter note. The quarter note, of course, as in common time. The most sensible and by far most common decision for a moderately paced song is to make each beat a quarter note. So we have three over four time, also known as waltz time. Three beats per measure, each beat worth a quarter note, a crotchet. The first two notes of happy birthday, the two dominants, are together equal to one beat, to one quarter note. So what notes are they, if together, they form a quarter note. A half note? That would be two quarter notes would make a half note. So it's an eighth note. Two eighth notes. Two eighth notes. Two eighth notes makes a quarter note. But more commonly for happy birthday, although we can find it written either way, the first of these two notes is longer than the second shorter note. And if you think about how we sing it, it's like this. Happy, long ha, short pi. Still, this difference in time might not be reflected in the sheet music. We might see this written as two eighth notes, like you said, and it's still correct. Why might that be? Can you think of a reason 
why we might not need to write this small difference in length between these two notes. Because it would just come naturally. Why would it come naturally? That was a quick answer, but why? Because the, the, the first beat is stronger. Because the first note is falling on the first beat, the strong beat, no? It's going to be emphasized anyway. And so beats can account for the small difference in length between these notes. We might not need to write it. Still, this tends to be written as two notes of different durations in Happy Birthday, not least because by most accounts, Happy Birthday doesn't actually start on a strong beat. The first strong beat of Happy Birthday actually falls on the third note, on birth. Happy birthday, no? Happy birthday. So it's not on ha, it's not on p, no? It's on birth, the first strong beat. So the first strong beat of Happy Birthday is falling on the third note. On birth, happy birth. But how can that be though, if the first beat of a measure is supposed to be the strong beat? Well, it is, only that some songs don't actually start at the beginning of a measure. And however unintuitive that might sound, it is a very common occurrence. A song might begin with an incomplete measure, or more precisely, the latter part of an incomplete measure. Happy birthday begins on the last beat of an incomplete or broken measure. So if you see a short measure at the beginning of a piece of music, this is what's happening. We have a pickup measure, or more simply, the song is not beginning on the strong beat. Another word for this is anacrusis, which of course has an application outside of music too, such as in literature. When a poem begins with a word or two that is somehow separate to the rhythm of the poem, it's the same thing that is happening in Happy Birthday, and in countless other songs too. So the first complete measure begins on birthday, which is also where the chord comes in, which I haven't been playing until now. So the two dominants we began Happy Birthday with are more commonly than not an anacrusis. The dominants are quieter in more ways than one than they would otherwise have been had they fallen on the strong beat. We might say that the extra layer of tension of wondering whether we are in tonic or dominant territory, whether we're in the key of the tonic or now in the key of the dominant, is not a feature here. Things remain simpler than that in Happy Birthday.